everybody. Welcome back to Edwin the Magic Engineer from Orlando, Florida. I'm in my new man cave. Got a little setup here. It's a little bit more interesting to look at. And uh, I'm sorry I've been mostly gone for a while. I've been moving and it's been difficult. And we're now, we're, we left Houston, Texas. We're in Orlando, Florida. I'm in my new home right now. There's still boxes everywhere, but I was at least able to get this set up <laughs> and do something kind of fun that you guys can actually look at and uh, have some something more interesting than just my stupid face to look at. And uh, I've got a bunch of topics I've been looking to cover. I've got a special one for you today that's actually based on a question that I got from uh, somebody that actually sent me an email to my Gmail account that's listed right below in the actual comments. I got a, a question from Kevin Newman, actually, and I told him that I was going to do a video response for it. But before I get into that, I just want to quickly mention some of the videos I've got coming up uh, here in the very near future. I'm going to do a new series here that I'm going to call um, Pack and Point Series. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have like a topic that I think is an interesting topic that I hope is interesting. And at the end of it, I'm going to open a booster pack. And I've got a whole stack here of booster packs, and some of them, you can see we've got some revised packs here. We've got Fallen Empires, i got a Legends pack. But then there's also like Alliances and the Dark and um, Unglued and stuff like that. So we can kind of keep a series like that going for a little bit and uh, do some fun stuff with that. So that'll be the Pack and Point series. Um, another thing I'm going to do, and this is probably going to be the next video, is I played that deck I call Rub Crazies in GP Vegas uh, for GP Vegas, the old school championship for 2018, and I took second with that deck, but then I modified it a bit and I played it again in the summer derby and just did terrible with it. And so there's some uh, specific reasons for that. I thought about the deck design, I thought about that meta, and I've got some interesting points to go over, and that's not this video, that's coming up pretty soon. And um, I'm going to be doing a video in just a little bit, specifically addressing all the newer players who are not old school players or vintage players, but that want to get into those formats and feel like they can't, and it's basically like a I'm sorry video for all you guys, and here's some things that I do see that you can do. And um, I'm going to talk about, in another video, the whole old school and Wizards of the Coast. There is an interesting interaction there. There's a lot to be said that I think needs to be discussed. But on to the topic for today, specifically. Oh, sorry, one more thing. Uh, some of you guys have also been asking about doing upgrades to some of the budget decks. And that's actually something I was always planning to do. I was planning to do budget deck series, and then I was going to do mid-range decks, and then I was going to switch back over to start doing a lot of like uh, higher-end, tier one, old-school decks. Um, so I did the budget series, and I started getting into doing the mid-range series, and I've got some decks laid out, but uh, you guys need to understand that takes a lot of playtesting, because I don't put decks forward unless I think that they're actually worthy of being put forward. In order to put them forward, I need to build them and then refine them and play test them a bunch and then put them out there as like something to consider. So I've got a lot of mid-range decks I've already worked on, a lot of lists, but like they're not ready to be shown yet. They're they're still in process. And I've got another real high-end tier one deck that's actually coming. Uh, so that one's gonna be really cool too. Anyways, let me get to the original topic. The topic is uh so Kevin Newman asked me about how to buy power cards. Uh, specifically for vintage, old school, all that. But I'm going to expand that topic a little bit because I think that the advice that I'm going to give actually works for other formats as well, like Legacy and the other non-power cards for like vintage and old school and stuff like that as well. So um, first of all, I'll go through my history because he asked about that. Like, because he said, you know, I heard that you, you said, Edwin, you said that you bought and sold power cards several times, and I did. I have bought Power 9 four times, and I've sold them three times. So as of this moment right now, I have a set of Power 9, but I'm not planning on selling it unless someone around me is dying or something seriously wrong is going on. I'm not going to sell them. But um, I have sold them three times, and uh, the story behind those was basically, I'll try to like say it real quick so I can get to Kevin's question. So I originally got into Magic in 1996. I very quickly realized that like vintage was the format I wanted to get into. 
So I traded, bought, sold everything I could to get, get myself into that format. And this was in Chico, California. And I got myself a set of Unlimited Power 9, and I was playing in what we called the Type 1 tournaments back in Chico, California. That's actually where I met Jason Murray also, because he used to be, he was in Yuba City, and he would come to Chico, and I would play against him in those tournaments. So anyways, um, I had that unlimited set of Power 9, and then what happened is I just wanted to upgrade it to beta. So I spent time like upgrading each card one at a time to beta, and at the end of college, I graduated in 2001. By the end of college, I actually had made it. I actually had all of my Power 9 set was beta, and like all of them were mint, except for like two of them. It was fantastic. And like all my dual lands were there, like 10 of them were mint. I mean, it was a great collection, right? But I sold the whole collection for $4,000 at the end of college just because I had debt and like who knew where magic was going to go. And I love the cards, but I felt like I really needed a good start into my career. So I sold all those cards in the end of 2000, in 2001, like that whole collection. And that was four workshops, four Bazaar of Baghdad. I mean, just, I mean, you name it, it was there. It was a huge collection. And I sold it to a guy that was, I think his name was Jeff in Texas or something like that for four grand in 2001. So then fast forward a few years later, like 2004, I'm working for Intel in Hillsboro, Oregon, just missing those cards and regretting that I'd actually sold them. So I started working my way back into it and I eventually had reacquired a set of unlimited power nine. And um, then I had gotten a few other like staple cards here and there, like some workshops and a bazaar and a set of mana drains and a tabernacle and stuff like that. But then all, I had those all the way until about 2011. And in 2011, I have so many hobbies as you guys can kind of see with all this junk here. Um, I just wanted to like spend money on radio control cars and guitars and like other stuff. Cause like there was nobody around to play all these vintage games with. Like nobody was playing vintage in the Portland area. So I sold uh, like my top 20 cards. I kept all the rest. So that big collection you see, I still had all that, but I just sold the top 20 cards for like $7,000 at the time in 2011. And I used that money, like I gave some to my wife so she could blow on stuff and I bought way to control cars and guitars and all that stuff. And just kind of the money went all over the place. But shortly afterwards, I regretted it again. And it was just like, you know, why did I do that? You know, I should have just waited to fund those hobbies through other things. So I really missed them. And so shortly afterwards, I started like pooling together money to try to like rebuy my way into power. But the whole time, you know, the price is going up. But it wasn't insane yet, right? So um, I sold like half of my dual lands. So I only had two of each dual land, sold half of them, invested some of that money. It eventually came back from that investment. And that's what I used to buy that set of uh, beta that I, like all in this video that I'm linking actually uh, right now um, that video I'm linking that's how I bought that set like that money that came back out of investment that came from you know the half set of dual lands and stuff most of that went into rebuying that beta set and then I bought and sold some of those to complete that power set and that just happened recently so like a year and a half ago or something so that was my fourth set of power nine. And what I discovered every single time was I always wondered about this whole like bubble, you know, magic cards are in a bubble. When is it going to pop? You know, that's a big concern that people basically have. And you never really know, you know, when that, if that's going to happen, if it's going to be a bubble, is it actually going to pop? No one really knows for sure. So anyways, long story short, um, I've decided that I'm not going to sell them anymore. I don't believe they're going to have a big fall again. And um, maybe I should do a video on this topic at some point. The magic cards, basically, they have consolidated. I'm using financial terms here because not everyone is used to finance talk. The high-end magic cards, especially the graded stuff, it's consolidated into strong hands. What that basically means is the people that actually own those cards are the kind of people that don't have to sell. They're the kind of people that if you go into a financial downturn, you know, interest rates go up, housing prices start dropping, stock markets start dropping, people are worried for their jobs. The kind of people that own these cards are not the kind of people that are affected by those kinds of things and they're not likely to sell. So even with another downturn, I don't think that the real high-end magic cards are going to get hammered in price too badly. 
I think a lot of the mid-range and lower stuff that is owned by, I mean, if you're a guy that has rent to pay and a mortgage and stuff and you have $5,000 worth of Magic Cards, you're probably going to sell it. But if you have $100,000 worth of Magic Cards and it was money that you had disposable, you're probably not going to be the kind of guy that's going to sell. So there will be a divergence there. Anyways, I'll talk about that some other time. Let's get to Kevin's question. Kevin's question was, how do you actually go about buying power cards? And I'm expanding that to how do you buy expensive, vintage, legacy, old school cards? I know two solid ways. And this is what I keep telling everyone, two solid ways to do it. One of them is basically, if you have the funds to do it, this will absolutely get you the best price. Absolutely, bar none, this is the way to do it. In fact, this is basically what stores and big vendors basically do. The second way, if you don't have a huge lump sum of money that you can throw at it and you're going to have to like walk your way in slowly, it's probably the best way that I know of because there's a balance of like fun versus budget and everything. So first you got to decide what camp you're basically in. Are you going to be the guy that's going to go for the best deal? You're going to get the best price, which requires a lot of money, or are you going to have to kind of slowly walk your way in? Now let's first talk about the big purchase because this one, it's just, it's easier to explain. Let's say you want to get into like uh, something really expensive. You want to get into like old school with the prices now that are just insane. Let's say you have some old school decks you want to target. Maybe you need like fifteen thousand uh, dollars of card value to basically get into old school. Well, one way to do it is if you can pull together for short term, like uh, say. 20,000, 30,000, say $30,000, right? You can get like a large amount of cash. Then you try to look around for a collection. Maybe you shoot for like a 50 to $45,000 of value collection. And when you find that person, offer them like, you know, 30 grand cash on the spot, right? Because what happens is a lot of times the people that, that, that are willing to sell those kinds of cards, they have something big they're going for. They, they want to make a down payment on a house or they want to move it over to something else or maybe they're not a strong hands kind of investor. They're the guy that bought them a while ago and they're looking at the kind of things that they can go do, right? So, so a person that is being offered cash and they don't have to go on eBay, they don't have to spend all this time, they will very often take that, like let's say $45,000 of value of cards and they'll take 30 grand for it, right? So now you buy those cards, you've put in 30 grand, right? But now you start selling those cards back off. And, but you take the ones that you specifically needed for your deck and you move those to a side and you start selling off the other ones. Cause we said it was 45 grand worth of cards, right? At some point, maybe you've sold like 20 grand worth of cards back off, right? So now if you look at your actual initial investment, you, you, you actually have 30 grand that you put in. You've now gotten 20 back. You're only down $10,000, right? But it was $45,000 worth of cards. And you've now sold $20,000 worth of it. You still have $25,000 worth of cards, but you've only put in $10,000, right? That's how that basically works. This is effectively what dealers do. When the dealers make a big purchase, they will do like, they'll try to throw it all into a package deal and get a great price on the whole package. It's worth it to the seller because they just get it all done in one shot and, and they don't have to bother with eBay and all these individual sales and all the risk and all the time and all the effort. They just get their, their chunk of money and then they're gone, right? And it works for the buyer because if you're willing to put that kind of time in, you're gonna get that value. So that's the big purchase thing. Now I was using big numbers, right? Say it was a legacy deck and the legacy deck you want is $5,000, right? If you can put in like 10 for a little bit and then sell some of the cards back off, try to get your actual investment down to like maybe $3,000, but now you got that five to six, $7,000 kind of worth of value. Same kind of thing, same kind of trick can be played. That's the high end roller. And so that one works because you will absolutely get the best price per card, but it takes a lot of effort and it takes a large chunk of money at the beginning. So that's one strategy. Now the other strategy, and this is probably where most people are at, right? Myself included, by the way, right? Um, if you don't have like a huge chunk of money to just throw at it, right? Then what you can do, and this especially works really well with like old school, right? And, and I'll say why in a second. Let's say uh, you have uh, $300, $400 at the moment, and you want to get into the old school format, 
the deck you eventually want is maybe say fifteen hundred dollars, right? It's a less expensive deck, uh, but but you only have like three hundred bucks at the time, right? Well, what you can do is you can go out and buy like something that you're wor willing to play. Like maybe you're gonna play like a mono black deck, and so your money is gonna go into like you know the dark rituals and the hypnotic specters and all the him to Turak and all these things. And maybe there's a few key cards that actually have a bit more value that brought that price up. But the point is you've only put in like $300. Now, the thing about old school is that it never rotates out. This is that point I was going to mention. Old school cards, they'd never go away because Wizards doesn't, like, they don't control that format. They're not printing cards for the format. They don't make the rules for it. It's just a few sets of cards and that's it. And by the way, if you guys are wondering what rules people use, Eternal Central is most people in America, in America and around the world. There's a few people that do Swedish and other rule sets, but most of it's Eternal Central. I'll put that link below in the description. Anyways, so say you put that $300 into old school, right? Well, five years from now, those cards are still going to have value because nothing rotated out. There was a new, new card that printed and devalued all these current ones because now these ones are crappy and this only this one is good. That doesn't happen with the format. The format is locked in what cards are actually there, and players tend to actually know which cards actually have value. Now the market is changing, but that's like a supply demand thing and based on investor sentiment, other things like that. It's not so much based on is, is this new card coming in and changing everything. Like that doesn't really happen, right? So if you put $300 into cards of old school and then say you put it in a closet and then you come back a few years later, well, all those cards still have value and they've all probably gone up. You can still jump into a tournament and you can play it. So it's like once you've bought them, it's like free to play. You can always go to a tournament and jump into a tournament and actually play. So it's like you've got your foot in the door, right? But here's the trick. That deck that you wanted was like a $1,500 deck or something, but your current one was like a $300 deck, right? Well, then start doing little upgrades on it, like right? Maybe instead of just that mono black, maybe you start buying a couple scrublands here or there. You got your black, white dual land, right? Eventually you get a set of four scrublands, and then once you've got those, then you start putting disenchants and plows in the deck. You kind of like upgrade it and you modify it and it's like your, your value of that deck kind of keeps going up. You started at 300 and has birthdays and Christmases and bonuses at work happen. Eventually now that deck gets up to like $800 of value, right? And maybe by this point, you're really tired of playing that black white deck. You want to do something else, but there's this like red green credit lightning bolt berserk deck that looks like a lot of fun, right? And so at that moment, if you decide you want to trade those black, white cards for some red, green cards, people will totally do it because it's old school cards for old school cards. They're all going up in value. None of them are being like, you know, you can't reprint the originals and stuff. And so, so you will always be able to trade into another color. And so you look at it like this nest egg of cards that kind of keeps growing and growing. And it could be in like one color or play style, or it could be in another. You can shift it as, as you want around by like either using eBay or trading with friends. But the point is that value grows. And at some point you look and you, you realize, wow, I've got about that $1,500. I can now eventually play that deck that I wanted to play. And maybe you trade into that and now you're there. Or maybe as you were building throughout that format, maybe you decided that that deck that I originally thought I wanted to play doesn't really look that look, look like that much fun because you got a chance to experience the metagame a little bit. You got to see what that deck was actually like and maybe there's something else that compelled you more. That's the other thing about getting into a format like that and slowly building your collection is like you're actually experiencing the format. You're meeting the people, you're making friends, you're learning about how the cards work. And so it's, it's, like a, it's a back and forth kind of learning experience that's going the whole time. So I think that works pretty well. So you've got these two strategies. One of them is take a big chunk of cash way over what the value you actually need is and offer someone a cash offer on the spot, get an amazing deal, sell off the singles by on your own. So your net investment is pretty low, but now you've got the collection worth of cards that you were actually going for. That's one way. Second way is just work your way in, play the format as you go, learn about the cards as you actually go, learn about the meta and stuff like that in your local area, get to get some strategy and get to be familiar with old school. You might even change which direction you're going to go. And it's just such a beautiful format because 
I mean, just like I said, you put a deck down, you forget about it for 10 years, and then you come back, and it's all there. And you just jump into a tournament, and you play again, and stuff like that. So anyways, those are the two big ways that I know, and that works for Power 9, that works for Old School, that works for Legacy, Vintage, stuff like that. But this, this works best for Old School because it's an eternal format, right? It doesn't work as well for Vintage and Legacy, which I love both those formats, by the way. But for like Vintage, a card can be printed and come in and it can just ruin everything. Or maybe Wizards of the Coast, like you spend all this time and money getting like this one certain deck. And then Wizards of the Coast says, oh, well, we're finally going to restrict we Misha's Workshop down to one, right? And then it's like, you've got time building this deck, you traded for him. You got artist signatures and like an altars and all these cards. You were all excited about it, and they just ruined it by just restricting one of your key cards, right? That happens, right? So that's why I like old school more because it's more stable. And that matters more when you're putting more money into it. Anyways, Kevin Newman, that was for you. That was the video response that I promised. So thanks everyone for sticking around. And uh, come on back here pretty soon to see that rub crazies that that it's like a red, blue, green, old school aggro creature deck that I played in the championship and that I played in the derby. And like, I'm gonna talk about the evolution of that deck coming up real soon here, guys. Bye.